All right, folks, uh, we're going to get started this afternoon. We've got Leslie here from the Forest Service. She's going to talk about pests and disease identification. So that's all I got. Go ahead, Leslie. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm Leslie Johnson. I'm the Forestry and Fire Management Team Leader. First thing I want to check and make sure is I'm talking loud enough that the people in the back can hear. We don't want people nodding off. Are, are we good? Okay. Yeah, if I didn't see any kind of indication, I would have talked louder. <laughs> uh, um, so if I do drop off, please wave or something to let me know, okay? Because I'm not going to be aware of that. Um, and I'm also going to try to talk loud enough so that people joining us by Zoom can hear. Um, I'm the forestry and fire management team leader with the North Dakota Forest Service. Um, I know you were really hoping to see Pete Gogg here. Pete Gogg is our forest health manager. He gives a really good presentation. Well, you're in luck, although Pete's not here, he did develop the presentation. So, so with a little bit of luck, you're gonna learn everything that he had planned to tell you. Um, uh, so uh, what my job is, uh, all, of the, all of the forestry programs and fire programs that work directly with landowners, uh, I'm, I oversee those programs. And um, I was just wanna tell you that I'm so glad that you invited Pete to be here. And I'm really kind of glad I get to substitute for him because um, you, I really admire the work that you folks do and you're getting tired of hearing that. And it's right after lunch. So um, I also wanna put a plug in for just next door, the program next door that's given by uh, Beth Hill, our outreach and education manager, that's going to be an excellent presentation. So if anyone wants to go over there and catch that, it's. Perfectly fine with me. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the project learning tree is, is great. As a matter of fact, I, we probably should have set up a, a PLT activity that would involve everybody moving around for right after lunch. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about um, tree insect and disease identification. And unless I get off of Pete's outline. Okay. Oh, my goodness. A little. Um, I can see that coming, and it, and I guess I can. I'll try not to move around too much. All right. Um. So this is just kind of the outline. Uh, these are the things that um we want to talk about today. First of all, there's this kind of like decline, recovery, seesaw. Uh, it's like a, a kind of a tension uh, that you'll notice in trees. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about trees in North Dakota um, and how tough it is, how tough of a place this is for them to work. Um, challenging site conditions. We'll talk about um, uh, uh, the insect and diseases that um, uh, for the commonly occurring trees here. I'm not going to go into a lot on tree identification because uh, Joe Zalesnik will get you guys after you've had your uh, afternoon, early afternoon nap uh, to talk about that in a little while. Um, and I know you know this, but we're going to talk again about why diversity is really, really important, um, especially as we plant trees. One of the things we're going to touch on just a little bit about is salt tolerant species. And I hope Pete did a good job of putting that together for us because um, uh, he knows more about that than I do. And then the star forms. And oh, I do have some uh, presents that uh, uh, left over from Tom's talk earlier. So if you can answer questions, you can come pick up. Whatever's in this bag, you can come take it. I, I kind of like the bag too. So. <laughs> Get rid of the bag too. All right. So, does anyone know what the star form is? Uh, okay. So, okay. Liz. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Come and, yeah. Oh, you got some already. All right. Oh, yeah. Now I got presents that people don't even want my presents. Okay, the other thing is I hope you got um, a, uh, this. Uh, this is hot off the presses only. It's kind of cold from being in the trunk of my little Jeep car. Um, common insects and mite pests of trees in the Great Plains uh, and front range. Um, we don't have the front range here, but we definitely have Great Plains, don't we? Uh, and this was just put together by the Great Plains Tree Pest Council. Um, and uh, so, and one of the authors, I know some of the authors in here. Matter of fact, uh, you might be able to get Joe to sign one, sign a copy for you. Or <laughs> anyway, so some of us help help out with that. That was pretty good. I've got to do some more talking though. Oh, I'm sorry. I need yeah. to. <laughs> You're fine. All right. Okay. Um, don't worry about how little that uh, look that little graphic is. Oh, because uh, uh, you're going to see it. Uh, 
a lot bigger here in a minute. So um, trees are like always in this kind of fluctuating state of health, right? Uh, especially here in North Dakota, because our, our, our climate and our soils often make for less than ideal soil conditions for them. Uh, and so as it gets dry and windy, what happens is photosynthesis is really hard. It's really hard for trees to do uh, photosynthesis. It's hard for the cells in trees to do photosynthesis. Um, and so that makes energy less available to trees and that weakens them a little bit. Okay, and then, uh, uh, I mean, that's like every day or seasonal or, you know, whenever we're having a drought or that sort of a thing. So that makes the tree a lot more vulnerable to uh, pests, the insects and disease pests. Um, so the level of stress is, their level of stress is pretty well correlated with uh, insect and disease, uh, you know, their vulnerability to insects and disease is kind of like people, I guess. Um, so uh, one of the things we look for is like you get more stress, then the trees are going to have more defoliators, more bark beetles, more wood borers. Um, so sometimes when someone comes and says, you know, my tree has this pest, what do I do? Well, the first thing you really need to do is you need to do things that will support that tree. water, okay, mostly water, but sometimes too much or too little water. But, you know, if uh, get that tree to where it's not vulnerable to that pest is usually one of the first things you need to do. But um, the uh, next slide is, yeah, okay. So th that's a little bit larger uh, example of the slide there. So you can kind of see like uh, a tree can kind of slip into where it's, a tree can do, do trees are really amazing. Um, one of the things I remember learning in my wood tech class is how much a tree, a tree can take and still live. I mean, when they're studying like properties of wood, they do terrible things to trees like cut chunks of them out and, you know, oh, well, the tree's still living. Um, and uh, so trees can take terrible abuse, but there's a limit, there's a limit. And we've reached the limit for some trees around here. I know um, a couple of years ago, uh, people were calling me uh, that mature bur oaks were just giving up the ghost, you know? They looked fine one year and then they were just turned toes up, turned roots up, I guess. Uh, all of a sudden it seemed like, well, it wasn't all of a sudden, it was, they'd been through drought too wet, drought, too wet. Their soils were damaged. They never had a chance to recover. And it was these big old mature trees. And so you'd think, wow, these big trees, they've got all these big crowns, you know, they should be doing great now. Uh, we just got rain after all this dry period. Well, they weren't, they just couldn't respond to that good, you know, the moisture that had just come because they had had, uh, they were already vulnerable to borers. They were already vulnerable to root diseases. Um, and uh, yeah, I could talk more about them, but I can't remember the scientific names and you would be really, really bored anyway. But so they were vulnerable. They just couldn't respond when the weather got that good again. They'd gotten into this little seesaw where they just couldn't recover anymore. And then they used up the last of their energy resources, maybe pushing out leaves that year, maybe pushing out uh, acorns the fall before, and that was it. Um, some folks say, and I think I've seen this, you know, when you see a tree that really bears strong, that means the tree is stressed and it's about to go out. Well, sometimes trees just bear, you know, like uh, uh, inconsistently. And sometimes, yeah, it's their last hurrah, but you can't really decide which tree to cut down based on whether or not they had a heavy fall acorn crop. Uh, all righty. Um, and here's a couple things that should be kind of familiar to you. Um, Oh, here's here's a question. So another chance for you to get uh, a present that like Liz didn't want any of. So why can conditions in North Dakota be challenging for trees? And I'm not telling you because you don't know, but I'm telling you to help wake you up just a little bit. So what what is it about North Dakota that makes it hard to grow trees here? Okay, lack of rain, so moisture, right? Okay, what else? What, uh, what other kinds of things might be might make it? Does it tell you right up there? Oh yeah, it tells you right up there. <laughs> okay, so just read if you can. I mean, if it's not too small for you, just read it. Say precipitation, and sometimes it's not just not enough. Sometimes it's too much, right? The precipitation is just coming at the wrong time. Okay, all at once and then nothing. That's that's hard on some trees. Although um, uh, for some trees, if you get enough in the spring, it'll carry them through quite a long dry period. Others not so much. 
So, but in general, in North Dakota, we get less precipitation. So on the west side of the state, like we got what, 20 inches, or not west side, I'm, I said that backwards. On the east side of the state, there's like 20 inches, sometimes 22 inches. And it's okay to Google it and correct me. I, it's, I'm, I'm cool with that, right? But then you go west, 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 all right. You get down to like maybe 10 inches. Okay, now that's pretty bad. Now, did you know that about 4,000 years ago, until about 4,000 years ago, between 4,000 years ago and then back even farther to the glaciated period, North Dakota was a forest. It was spruce fir forest. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Okay, and then 4,000 years ago, it got really dry. And, you know, uh, uh, our prairie grasses were favored. And so that's why we have, we still have forests along the rivers and everything where it's wet, but prairie grasses, this is a prairie state. Um, so yeah, precipitation. I don't know why I added that, but I just knew it. So I felt I needed to share it with you. Um, and our soils here are almost exactly the opposite of what trees need. In forests, you've got like this nice organic layer right up at the top because leaves fall and, and uh, you know, it gets really rich. And, and in prairie soils, isn't the organic material, isn't that mostly tied up in the plant itself? Am I making this up? Is that right? Okay, the, the soil horizons look a lot different in forests and, and in prairies. And in many places, um, uh, the topography will like limit drainage here. So we've got like, it looks flat, okay, but it's not really completely flat. There's a little bit of a low place here. You can kind of see that in here. Yeah, a little bit of a low place. You can't even see it with your eye, right? But the trees know, they're like browning and uh, uh, other trees are doing all right. So that's very likely a, a site thing. Um, and then um, uh, here's another thing, about half of the trees in our landscapes are planted off site. But see the trees in that bottom picture? Okay, so we got like ponderosa pine people, like. Um, Tom showed us earlier is in the top left. Okay. And some of those look kind of bad, but it's not, some of those look kind of rough. Okay. So, so every once in a while they'll have a rough year. But on the bottom, that's spruce. Okay. And we love to plant spruce. People love seeing spruce, but spruce live in Colorado. Spruce want to be 6,000 feet higher. That's not something that we can give them here. Um, we do the best we can, but that's not something we can do here. We, so we push the limits. We push the limits on some of those trees. And I'm not saying don't plant them, plant them where your soil, but what is it, CTSG? Plant them where it says you can plant them. But try, if, if you try to push it, you're gonna, probably gonna have problems. Okay, and then, um, the, and then we have what we call uh, introduced planting errors. That doesn't mean you're planting them upside down, but th th it's, it's things like, it might be the wrong species for the site, okay? So that, that could be a planting error or a design error. Might be, um, the spacing might not be right, and you've got guidelines for that, and that's good. Could be uh, uh, one thing we see sometimes is the uh, trees are girdled. They're girdled by the very fabric that let them grow in the prairie in the first place, you know, but might not have been removed, or they might have been twisted when they were planted. You know, uh, I don't know, somebody was just, did their Monday trees, and you had somebody that was not in, you know, really good shape for a Monday and didn't get the trees in the ground right, you know, so. And then, uh, or it just might be, you know, Maybe the soil is okay, but the way the topography is, it's wet. So anyway, so there's all kinds of things that make it tough on trees. And whoever guessed right, you know, you've got, you can have the bag or you can have like, I don't know, smoky things that you can throw around or <laughs> hanky, smoky. I like kind of like me, smoky hankies. All right. Okay. And then, uh, oh shoot, I'm, I'm spending way too much time on just one thing, I think. So is that, okay. Then we've got like, um, uh, climate, right? Precipitation. And... <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kelly, thank you so much for helping me. Yeah, I'm like, no problem. <laughs> okay, I see that there. It's like, oh, that yeah. looks good. It's not the one I'm working on. I'll try to remember to fix that now. All right, so um, this is like, uh, I think it's in Grand Forks. No, it's Grand Rapids. Okay. Oh, God. Okay, Pete would have done a much better job of this. All right, so. Um, Look at, look at the timing and amount of uh, annual precipitation across North Dakota as compared to not very far to the east, like Grand Rapids, Minnesota, all right? So the timing is way different. You can't even see it. You can't even see that, okay? But that's why the different, the different colors are. Um, and uh, what it does is it, it creates the timing. Okay, we get a lot of water early. Then we got a long dry period. That's hard on trees. It makes them grow shorter. You know, they have less incre annual increment that they're growing, and it gives them stress, as we talked about. Um, and uh, 
The other thing we have is just warmer temperatures, partly because we don't have so much vegetation that can, you know, moderate the temperatures, the, the daily temperatures, and um, uh, also less uh, less sunlight, so that less time for photosynthesis, growth, tree health, and then, gosh, it gets cold pretty soon, pretty early, so uh, less time in the fall that you can have some really good tree growth or really good root growth. And I think that's kind of enough for that one. All right, now here's a, this is kind of interesting. Um, this is kind of a valuable set of images kind of to drive home the point that this is a prairie landscape, okay? This is a 1960s image and a 2021 image of uh, part of North, of, of North Fargo. It's by uh, El Zagal. Oh, it's a public golf course there in, in uh, North Fargo. So there's a, the, like the historic disturbance regime, okay? That would have been fire on prairies and the prairie soils and the climate discouraged tree development, but people needed to live with trees, you know? And so they, they uh, planted them and it, it changed, that, changed that area, uh, changed the soil site. It changed everything, made it to where folks can live here. So trees certainly can grow on the prairie, as you can see, but they need a lot of, they need some babying, they need help, they need every bit of help that you can give them when you need to plant them where they need to be planted. Um, and the most, the main, one of the main things that they need is water. And so that, um, uh, one thing that you really help considerably with uh, is uh, your, um, your, the fabric. The fabric makes, uh, makes it in a climate where uh, tree roots can grow, where trees can grow. Right now, um, uh, Pete uh, was going to talk about common trees of North Dakota, but I don't think we'll talk about that because, uh, because Joe is going to come and give a presentation on common trees of North Dakota. Um, but they will, uh, but so we'll just introduce them as I go through the pests that each of them kind of have. Um, but first of all, oh, okay. So like, oh my goodness, okay. You know, some of the trees are uh, bur. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, and then I tried to read my slide. That was kind of silly of me. Um, you know, these trees we talked about them uh, just a few minutes ago. We have native and non-native trees um, here, and so I'm just going to go ahead and skip. But one of the things I wanted to talk about, and is that there's kind of two general rules that uh, plant health people or forest health people kind of can keep in mind, and you can remember this. And so when someone says why, why does this tree look bad? We can go, well, we've had um, kind of a cool wet spring, so it's probably a disease. Or we've had a long, hot, dry spell, so it's probably an insect. There, and I don't know if you'll win any bets, but um, that's, you know, so when it's hot and dry, think insects, look for insect signs. When it's cool and wet, think diseases. Um, and one of the reasons, and you're thinking, uh, I don't know. I don't know what you're thinking. What are you thinking? What kind of pests do you see? What kind of pests do you see that maybe don't fit that? Okay. So foresters aren't the only people that can be stumped. SCB employees can be stumped also. But if you have something, that's good because those aren't perfect. It isn't perfect. Here's um, the 2022 growing season was kind of interesting. We went from extreme drought for a prolonged period to a rather wet spring. And so uh, we, had both, we had both issues for a while. Uh, when, when I had Pete's job, the first year, the main calls that I got were people calling about spruce problems. Any kind of spruce problem there was, it was spruce, okay? And then after that, for like the next two, two years that I had that position, every problem I had, almost every problem I had, 75% of them anyway, were uh, from herbicide damage, okay? But what the calls that Pete is getting now is pretty much environmental stress. It's because it's too wet one year and it's too dry the next year. And so that's kind of interesting that, that uh, the calls that we get are, are reflecting the things that the trees are going through. Um, the uh, drought weakened trees then from 21 were really vulnerable to diseases in 22. Now, um, I'll go through some of the, some, this is what you really came for, some of the pests that you're going to find out there. And uh, 
Uh -oh. That's kind of hard to read, but what, okay, bur oak, think of bur oak. What kind of things do you notice on bur oak? What kind of tests or what kind of questions have you seen? Or what kind of symptoms have you seen that you have questions about? If I can't answer it, there's um, probably, uh, Doug Wiles has probably seen it, so. All, all the bur oaks that you plant are doing fine. You don't see anything wrong with their leaves. Their leaves look funny. Their twigs look funny. Yeah, yeah, they get bullet galls are really common on bur oaks, and sometimes you'll get leaf galls also. So usually those aren't really a, a terrible problem. I think we've got something on calls, galls here. No, not specifically. Yeah, yeah, we, we may have. Okay, so anyway, we'll go through a few um, a few uh, problems with bur oaks. Um, one of them is, uh, make sure I'm on the right one. Oh, okay, two line chestnut bore. Um, the two-line chestnut borer, it loves stressed bur oaks. It's very happy when it gets to stressed bur oaks. Sometimes it's the things that pushes them over the edge. Like the um, large tree that I was telling you had been through so many stress cycles. It, uh, it could have been two-line chestnut borer. Um, but uh, the thing to look for is the tree will start to have dead branches in the top, and then it'll kind of work down the tree. That, um, that, you, that will tell you that. Another thing that you'll see is canker worm, right? We've had some years where we had really good populations of canker worms. That's those little inch worms that come out and they, they eat uh, leaves. Um, they, aren't, they don't usually hit burl first. They usually hit elm trees first, but you'll find them in uh, May and June maybe. Okay, so what do you do for each of these? It's really hard to do anything. The main thing you can do is just improve the site conditions if you can, and they need water. Um, if the trees are stressed, they're not going to be uh, harmed so much by any of these. You can, if the tree can fight back, it, they'll be okay. And the trees can uh, suffer like two, three, maybe even four years of uh, repeated defoliation by canker worm. So, and usually canker worm populations will get real bad and then uh, expire before uh, they uh, defoliate things completely for that, for that often, that many times. Okay, now do I have piercing sucking insects behind me? Yes, okay. Um, another thing that bur oak gets really commonly, and this is why people don't want to plant their plant, don't want to park their cars underneath bur oaks in communities, and that is they have uh, insects that are true bugs. They have piercing sucking mouth parts. Bugs like this that suck um, the sap out of trees, out of tree leaves, will make honeydew that will, you know, they poop out honeydew and it'll get all, all over your car. And sometimes it's kind of hard to get off. And that includes aphids, something called adelgids, and it's kind of hard to tell the difference, but like uh, in, entomologists like to tell you that they're two different bugs, even though they look pretty much the same. Lace bugs, they're kind of annoying, and some people think that they bite, but they don't really bite. Um, they just do uh, a lot of, they make a lot of honeydew. Spider mites and scales, all those things will um, weaken, like they'll do a like, little bit of weakening to um, trees, and I mentioned they produce honeydew. So for management for these things, pretty much is none. They almost never cause significant damage to trees, but they can encourage sooty molds. There are some there are some exceptions to that. Um, if you're if uh, and there are ways you can treat, but that would be like a, not treating a, a, a windbreak, but like if you had a tree in town that was really um, seriously declining because of those issues, you can do something about that. Now here's a new one. You guys are going to be some of the first people to know that baroque blight isn't there. Yes, baroque blight is in North Dakota. Um, not that you should be happy about that, but uh, we hadn't been able to confirm it, and we uh, and uh, Pete confirmed it with our uh, the plant path lab did um, a molecular 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 analysis, and so we do have baroque blight in North Dakota. Um, what it causes is death um, between the death, death of the leaf veins and intravenal tissues. So you can see that's not, when a leaf is just stressed, it'll like die back from the edges, okay? And the veins will stay nice and green usually, right? This one like cuts across that. The veins are dead, the, the, leaf, the leaf is dead. So it's called necrosis or death of that tissue. Um, and usually, oh, and also this is good, crustos pustules on the petioles. So that's the stuff on the bottom, on the very bottom there. This probably has a pointer, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, devil's like, and, and it seems to be, it appears to be very widespread. Um, it wasn't just a single tree. It, it's like, it seems to be everywhere. 
Um, so that kind of surprised us. Um, but the nice thing is rural flight can look really, really terrible. And then one year, and then you won't see the symptoms the next year. So what we don't know is how long has it really been here? You know, and, and where did it really come from? It's kind of hard to say, but it's there. It's there now and we know it's there, um, but it doesn't seem to be, I, I hate to say, well, it doesn't seem to be that bad, but it's going to be another stressor. Um, but uh, it's, unless it happens, unless you notice it year after year, I think we might be okay for a while. Um, I first saw it down in Missouri and, and I was just, I was just, I, there's this beautiful burrow tree uh, in a park behind uh, where I lived there. And I thought that tree was going to croak. And the next year, it, you couldn't tell that it had looked so terrible the year before. Now, that doesn't mean that the tree wasn't harmed. It definitely would have been stressed, but it maybe isn't going to be as fatal as, uh, hopefully isn't going to be as fatal as we've been led to believe elsewhere. Um, okay. So, Jen, I'm sorry. Um, with the population of rural being so spread, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I would, I would, I would imagine it's spread by people, just like many other things. Uh, it probably, I don't know, is there association between the borough white spread and maybe the two line chestnut borer? I wouldn't be surprised if there were weren't an association there. So. I don't know, like you can point at firewood and, and like be right most of the time, but that's just my speculation. I really don't know. Um, some, uh, some diseases can be spread by um, infested nursery stock going from place to place. Um, but I don't know what else, to, to Tobacchia ioensis is the name for burrow flight. I don't know what else would get that that could have spread it. So, so it's like, well, it's here, just be aware. There's, um, there's some other things. Okay, oh, and um, I wanna offer you one little moment of hope. So if you do have a tree that's infested year after year, um, you, you, there are fungicides you can use, um, but the timing is really critical. So at that point in time, call the, oh, Pete, all right, um, let's see. And there's, uh, there's some other cankers. Okay, we're getting to the part where I didn't have time to make the, the letters bigger and I apologize for that. So I'll talk faster to help uh, make up for that. Um, there are some cankers that will cause, it's just called necrosis of the branches and the leaves and branches. So you'll see just a, a little bit of dieback here and there in oak trees, um, and it's Botrysperia canker. And then there's also a smooth patch of oak trees, and I get a, questions on this uh, every once in a while. Um, I was always told that this is not a, a harmful thing. Um, and so I'm hoping that it's, it's still not a harmful thing, but it will cause just like smooth areas on oak trees. And you'll notice it in really high use areas like parks. Well, I maybe it might be elsewhere, but maybe we just don't see it, but that's, that's pretty common. Okay. And then here's something that it's like, why do we care anymore? But uh, all native, uh, uh, like a lot of native North Dakota trees, green ash is found along river, river corridors. And, Sometimes those are kind of contiguous or continuous. Um, and that's where, that's because that's where moisture is concentrated in our topography, right? Um, so yeah, trees are associated with a little topography. Um, so when it's, uh, when green ash is planted outside those sites, like everywhere in North Dakota, pretty much in, in communities and windbreaks and whatever, especially after um, Dunch Elm disease uh, did in so many of our American elms, um, those trees are going to be a little more stressed than they would have been if they had stayed happily in their you know, river bottom or, or wetter area. So there are lots and lots of problems that green ash has. When they have the flat-headed apple tree borer, the red-headed ash borer, banded ash borer, pigeon tree mix, that, that kind of um, uh, worm, and uh, ash bark beetle. And then the damage from all of these pests is really, really easy to mistake for EAB, which as you probably know was found in um, Moorhead just uh, last month. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about that a little more, I think, but uh, it's, uh, uh, there'll be a survey pretty soon, uh, like next month, I think, to find out, to really take a look at the trees around Moorhead and in Fargo to see uh, how, how far it's gotten. Because whenever you find EAB, you never find tree one, okay? It's usually been there four or five years by the time it's found. Okay, so um, the thing is, all of these things, all of these other things bother 
ash trees that are stressed, okay? The EAB doesn't care if an ash tree is stressed or not. It'll go kill it, okay? If it can find it, it'll kill it. And if the population gets high enough. So that's what the difference between that is. Oh dear, I should have read a little farther. Um, yeah, uh, 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 EAB was found in uh, Moorhead on February 10th. Um, okay. I think I told you all the rest of this. Oh, some of the things that you need to look for if you're um, concerned about EAB is just watch for um, woodpeckers, woodpeckers uh, in the crowns of the trees. Um, they'll make little shallow divots in the bark um, and uh, everything else is deeper. All the other borers go deeper. So they'll be really you know, digging those out. But uh, EAB is just under the bark. It'll just pick a little, like maybe a dime sized spot. And, and so you'll be able to see the tree right underneath the, the hole in the bark. Right, uh, a lot of other things you won't be able to see. It's like you look like you could put poke something in that. So, um, and uh, the place to look is like up in the tree where the. That's good. Maybe I should go to the next one. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Oh, <laughs> it's, that, it's that it's so it's that it's just so hard to see there. Okay. Um, look at the edge like. When you look up into an ash tree, you'll see like where the bark is rough and then where it turns smooth. Look at that border between where it turns smooth and where it's where it's rough bark and smooth bark. That's a lot of times where you'll find EAB because the there's a place there for the eggs to hide. Well, for the female to hide the eggs that she's laid, and then they get out and they um, are happy to go into the thinner bark. So um, the eggs are really tiny, like a millimeter or two, and so you're not going to find them. Wow. Okay, I was going to describe the image, but it's um, you can't see it well enough. Okay, so um, in addition to those little shallow things, you, you want to look for a D-shaped exit hole. Um, I gave you these little uh, cards, uh, these cards here. Um, gosh, we had some that we poked like D-shaped exit holes in, and it's going to be a tiny exit hole, right? And one eighth inch exit hole, that's really super tiny. So look for those uh, tiny exit holes. The red, red-headed ash borer is going to have a little bit larger um, exit hole. Okay, D-shaped, tiny, like one eighth inch. Um, and uh, firewood. Look for it in, I don't know, wherever you see downed ash branches, um, and uh, wherever you see a group of dead ash trees. Okay, um, and uh, you're not probably not going to see the adult. The adult is going to emerge in like mid June. And later, because you have to have 450 to uh, 450 to 500 degree days for the, for it to emerge, growing degree days, um, uh, and 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 they're only out for a couple of weeks. They feed around a little bit in the tops of the trees, and then they lay their eggs, and then they die. You're probably not going to find those, but what you're going to see, what's going to be around all the time, is the crowns of the ash trees. So look for that. Look for um, serpentine flowers, galleries under the bark. Um, look for uh, epicormic shoots in the lower portion of the bark. Epicormic, that means they're not normal, right? They're, they're like, everything is like dead or, you know, you got dieback, plus you got these brand new sprouts. Those are the epicormic sprouts. Look for those. Um, and the first thing you'll notice usually is if you go, oh, those trees should be a little thicker. They should have a few more branches. So that's the first thing is just that general crown thinning that you'll probably see. I say you will, uh, eventually uh, you will. Okay, um, let's see. So uh, how do we manage it? The most important thing is to decrease the amount of ash in the canopy. Um, I think that's probably more for uh, in communities like that are vulnerable, but it's really important that they decrease their ash so that it doesn't get on our windbreak trees, right? So that we can keep our windbreak trees healthy longer. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, there's something you can do. You, when EAB gets to be within 15 miles of you, you can treat your, trees with insecticide. That's not something you're going to be able to do in windbreaks. So that's one of the reasons diversity is so gosh darn important. Um, I'm not going to give the, uh, uh, I'm not going to give the uh, pesticide, uh, uh, the chemical uh, treatment for that right now. Hey, does that say ash diseases behind me now? Thank, okay, all of you that nodded, you can come get a, <laughs> all right. Um, was there a question? Does anyone have any questions so far? You're just enjoying this or having a nice snooze or whatever. We're good. Everybody's good. Okay. 
Um, ash has lots of diseases too. It's not just the home for wayward borers. Okay, there's lots of fungus diseases. And when when did the, okay? Here's a good one. If you really earned this, if you can tell me what kind of weather favors diseases. What? Oh, you already won, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you for playing again. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, wet, cool wet, especially cool wet. Um, one of the things we get is anthracnose. It's like uh, uh, the leaves turn a little bit brown, maybe curl, and cool wet springs. Okay, when it's really bad, what happens? The leaves fall off. Pretty soon, though, they're ash trees. They're going to come back. Um, pretty soon, they have a new flush of uh, of leaves and you wonder why was I worried about that tree? Well, you the tree has been stressed definitely um, by losing its leaves, but um, often it'll, it'll be able to come back. Okay, and so usually you don't have to do anything. And yes, there are things you can do, but after you see the, um, the disease out there, it's too late. Funguses, fungi, you know, like ash anthracnose fungus, it gets in the tree, it gets in the leaves. Once it's there, you can't spray it and get rid of it. You just have to wait for it to be 80 degrees and then it'll die, the leaves will die, and the tree will get new leaves. We have uh, elm, is American elm, it's our, our state tree, as uh, Tom said earlier. Um, it has a lot of problems. Uh, one of them is elm bark beetle. Elm bark beetle is especially a problem because it vectors uh, Dutch elm disease. Oh, Dutch elm disease, see next slide. So hang on a second. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll go through the rest of the stuff, then we'll see the next slide. Okay, also I mentioned canker worms. Spring and fall canker worm love American elm. Sometimes that's why you see people have globbed sticky stuff on their trees because one of the canker worms doesn't like to crawl up past, doesn't like to get its feet icky and sticky and crawl up past that. Uh, and so, um, uh, but I, t I tell you what, those uh, insects that are gonna climb up, they not, might not climb up that tree, but they're gonna climb up some tree and those worms will get into that tree. Unless you get all of the all, unless you put sticky stuff around all of the trees in your neighborhood, or your windbreak, or wherever. Okay, and then we also have um, the piercing and sucking insects. What did they do to burrow? What did all the piercing and sucking insects do to burrow? Not you. What else did they? Any anyway, somebody else? What did the piercing and sucking insects do to burrow? What was the effect? You couldn't park under them because of honeydew. Thank you. Was that you? Oh, that was you. I think you answered before also, but that's okay. You know, when we're done, you come get a prize. <laughs> then you can get one of those nice handies. Okay. Um, so uh, most of this stuff, there's not really anything you can do. It's just like, huh, well, it's a tough year. Let's hope next year's better. Or, hmm, do you think maybe you could water these? They would be a lot less stressful going into next year. Okay. Now we'll get to the next slide. Does it say elm diseases behind me? Good. All right. Um, the most serious disease we have in elm by far is Dutch elm disease. Um, and it's spread by those little beetles. Uh, we have three different kinds of bark beetles. Isn't that nice? You know, one of them doesn't like the winter so well. One of them really loves the winter. So we don't get a break. Um, uh, it's spread by beetles. And also like if you've got like elms, a row of elms, think of uh, how, think of how some of the windbreaks that were planted years ago, the middle row that was American elm is like, nothing but dead and you can't get around in it, right? Okay, yeah, you try to walk through those, yeah. Um, uh, that's because, uh, not because the beetles went from tree to tree, that's because they shared a root system. Trees of the same species often do that. They graft underneath, this, uh, underneath the soil. They, they've got a secret life going on underneath there and they share fluids. That's disgusting, isn't it? Okay, <laughs> that's how Dutch elm disease gets from tree to tree. Um, by uh, through root grafts. So like if you cut down a tree, you're gonna have to sever those roots. There's a lot of work to try to stop Dutch elm disease when you get it in town or, or in, a, in, a, in a windbreak. And so that's why we see those uh, uh, rows that were elm that are now, I don't know, what, choke cherry and what comes in after elm? What comes into those places when the elms died? What, what have you seen that comes in? Choke cherry, uh, ash, I've seen green ash. I'm sorry. Box elder. Box elder. Yeah, that's not so bad. It's like a kind of a crooked tree, but you at least have a tree out of it. What else? What else? Anything? You're not sure? You haven't been here long enough. Um, a tree. Yeah. Yeah. Something else. Um, how about um, how about that ramnus? Do we do we get uh the invasive ramnus? Buckthorn. buckthorn. Do we get buckthorn in there? Maybe um maybe more in the east. Okay, buckthorn. Yeah, that's kind of a problem. Okay. Um. Okay. Oh. Uh, 
but that's about the only thing you can do. Okay, yes. Here's a question. So do Chinese Elm and Siberian Elm serve as a vector, like when they serve as a host, and not get impacted by Dutch elm disease? Or do they play into that they're not affected at all? Um, they can get Dutch elm disease, all right? And they have a, they have their own host of disgusting problems themselves, plus their invasion. So I don't. So some places it's like okay, you can grow something here, but maybe should you be growing anything there? Should you be maybe planting prairie grass? Yeah. So yeah. So then you got another question: Should we plant this tree here? How how badly do we need a tree here? How badly does this person's environment need that tree here? You know what what really should we be doing? Um, that's a good question though. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and they and they spread, so that's not good. But yeah, they have, oh, they have even more pest problems. Um, but for okay, I think I just told you what you need to do. So you're the only thing you can do really for American elm is to remove it. If you're in town, you can uh, put your tree on a. Uh, you can start to. It's not a spray. It's chemicals that are injected into the tree, and that will work about every three years. About every three years. Okay, cottonwood. I love cottonwood, but you know, cottonwood, you got to remember cottonwood is like, it's a bottom line hardwood it's, and, and hard doesn't describe the how hard its wood is. It just says, it just means it's got deciduous, it's deciduous, okay? It's got broad leaves. Um, and it uh, it's not meant to be a long, it's not a long, okay. It's not a long lived species um, compared to like burrow. It grows fast takes over the site and then dies. So you're gonna see old cottonwoods die. Sorry, um, that's just gonna happen. They're, they're, they grow rapidly and they decline. That's just how those are. And another thing, when they're off site, they're really vulnerable to drought. Cottonwoods wanna grow by the river. Where do we put them? We put them in somebody's yard. Um, and sometimes it's the only thing that can grow there. Like <laughs> Maybe like this, sometimes it's like, well, we got a chance if we plant cottonwood there. Um, and uh, so, but I mean, just like, don't expect them to last forever. Expect them to do their job. Expect them to grow fast and be there for a while and then probably die. In some places, they'll surprise you and they'll last surprisingly a long time. You know, maybe a hundred years, all right? And if they don't make it to a hundred years, it's not gonna be a problem. Or if they do make it to a hundred years, you're not gonna be there to celebrate or something. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the things that cottonwood is made for, okay? Cottonwood is like, it grows by rivers. What it wants is like, it wants the water to come up to make a nice, uh, to, you know, leave a nice uh, soil uh, mud bed for it to uh, spread its cotton in or to take chunks of it down the river uh, that will get lodged in the, you know, someplace else. And so parts of it, parts of it will live on that way. It's not meant to last there for a long time. It, it's meant to reproduce itself and, you know, and then it doesn't care, doesn't care about its body after that. Um, so for cottonwood though, you might need to, about the only management you can do is maybe remove any high high value trees or not high value trees, high hazard trees. So like if it's got a, if it looks like it's gonna fall on a swing set or your propane tank or something, um, those are trees that probably should be removed. Uh, any questions about cottonwood? And that's not a bad thing. Just know that what its place is in the, in the world, in its world. Um, now spruce, I, I, I really like spruce. I thought that was one of the coolest things when I came up to North Dakota and there were spruce everywhere. I was so excited. And then like, so I said, and you can grow spruce. And it's like, well, none of those are native. Oh, well, well like I said, they were about 4,000 years ago. Oh, my own spruce, yeah. Spruce has all kinds of really cool pest problems. Um, needle casts, uh, stigmina and rhizosphere needle casts. You'll notice that they start at the bottom of the tree and work their way up. And it doesn't matter which is which, you can control them both the same way. Trees need plenty of room. Use the, follow the planting guide, give them plenty of space um, so that they don't get too, uh, too moist uh, in the spring so that they dry out. And uh, um, there's also sprays, chlorothalonil. You, you can spray them, the bottoms of the trees to help uh, reduce this. And then there's cytosper. That's when you look at a tree and you see, oh, there's a, dead branch up here and down here and over here. And, you know, cytosper is like a branch here and there. You just prune those out. That would be really helpful. Um, then there's, okay, I just mentioned the needle casts. 
Okay, so uh, for the needle cast, you thin them to uh, improve the aeration or, or spray and cyto. Oh gosh, okay, I just told you what the management was. Now, uh, I don't mean to repeat myself. I just get a little ahead of myself. Okay, for pine insects. So we, we mentioned what, what pine did we learn about earlier? We're still on spruce. <laughs> We're still on spruce, oh, okay. Did I do that right now? Yeah, you're good. Okay, thank you. Okay, what pine did we, we've got some, we got, we grow some pines here. Um, Ponderosa, Tom said, was a uh, native. Okay, it's native in Southwest North Dakota. What other pine do we grow here that looks pretty darn good? Scotch pine, yeah, scotch pine. I, it's pretty, it, it grows up there and the top branches become orange. And yeah, I'm a um, little concerned about uh, pinewood nematode. We know that it, pinewood nematode, anytime it gets to be a uh, average temperature uh, in July of 70 degrees, did he write that down? I wish he did. No, he didn't. Anytime that the temperature is gonna be over about 70 degrees, um, you're vulnerable to pinewood nem nematode. Uh, the vector will, Bring, if the vector brings it in. And the vector is this big old, big old Sawyer beetle. Man, it's like not a tiny little, it's a big old Sawyer beetle. If one of those lands on you, you'll think it's going to chew your leg off, but it probably won't. Okay, um, pinewood nematode is killing a lot of exotic pines. It, it has, it's been working its way up um, north in South Dakota, north in South Dakota, well, you get it. Um, it kills uh, Scotch pine and Austrian pine. Anything else? Did he put that down here? Mugo pine. Oh my gosh. It kills mugo pine. I love those little mugo pines. Um, so your peas. Okay. Trees will die very rapidly. All right. You'll look at your tree. One day it will look nice and green. Okay. The next, maybe two weeks later, it's going to look a little off. So you're going, oh, it just looks a little bit gray. Maybe it's just the dust from the road, you know? And no, uh, the next day it's going to be red. It, they die really, really rapidly. The other things you can walk up to them, you can, you know, uh, scrunch, you know, they'll be dry to the touch. They'll be really scrunchy. Okay, so keep your trees healthy to discourage Sawyer beetle. And once, once it's present, not a lot can be done. Kill out, you can keep most of your scotch pines by getting rid of the scotch pines that you find that are infested, you know, as, as, as you can. Sanitation is your only hope, but you're, you're going to lose them. Okay, and so what's the other big thing is plant something else, right? Diversify. Uh, Boy, yeah, so there's, we're running out of stuff, but with climate change, we're gonna have more options pretty soon, right? <laughs> okay, and wait, we still have, I, oh wait, more pine insects, whoops, did I do that wrong? No, you're good. Okay, thank you. Um, but there's some other really cool pine insects, like there's um, pine moths, okay? These moths lay eggs and then the larva bore into the tree and then it looks like they're erupting sap. All right, and that's like Zimmerman pine moth, and then there's also tip moths and, and, and nodule makers. Um, so a uh, Zimmerman pine moth, you'll find that around branch whorls um, in ponderosa pines, and then uh, the tips moths, of course, they'll be on the tips of the trees. Um, and usually it's not, usually it's not too serious. I mean, it's not good for that particular tree, but it's usually not that terrible. And if it is, call, call, uh, call Peter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one thing it can do is it can make a, a weak spot in the tree to where it could be more subject to wind damage. And where do we want trees? We want them to stop wind for us. So that's not, kind of not a good thing. And um, of course, prune out whatever's dead there. Okay. And there are in insecticides you can use. And like I said, so call Pete and he'll fix you up with um, whatever the uh, most, whatever the latest um, recommendations are at that point. Right. And then uh, we've got some other pine diseases. The Plodius shoot blight and the canker disease. Um, it's on uh, two to three needle pine, which is like, um, you know, uh, Ponderosa and uh, Austrian. And do we have many Austrian pines around here anymore? Are there any? Okay, I don't remember seeing any for a long time. Okay, it's a fungus that weakens uh, stress trees, but you know, it's always out there. And it usually takes some event to weaken those ponderosa pines before they will get susceptible to the Plodia. It's not something that you can, we used to say, well, you know, clean up all your pine cones and clean up all your pine needles. Well, no, it's gonna come in from somewhere. So uh, sanitation like that is not gonna be very helpful. So just um, make sure that to keep the trees watered, especially when you're, um, uh, when they're getting started. Uh, but what, uh, what I noticed before in other states that I've worked is the Plodia will start killing trees when the trees get to be around 25 or 30 years old. So the trees that you're planting now, um, probably won't die until 
like 2050 something, right? 2060, okay. So you'll be, it, it won't be your fault. But uh, really just keep those trees healthy, uh, water them and, and it's less of an, less of an issue. Uh, good, uh, good example, Pete found, uh, we had a, a hailstorm come through in Southwest North Dakota and it looked like it was wiping out trees. Okay, what Pete found was uh, trees were damaged on one side of the tree only, they're, they're turned red. And uh, Diplodia has infected just the needles that were damaged by the hail that just didn't come straight down, you know, it's a little bit at an angle. So it takes uh, something like damage, like a hailstorm or something to kind of get it going. Another problem that you've probably seen is girdling roots. Um, and girdling roots usually come from poor planting practice. Too deep is the most common reason to have girdling roots, okay? It doesn't mean that you went and twisted them when you were planting. Okay, most trees, many trees can get over that and will grow out. Some trees will keep going in circles. It usually means the trees were planted too deeply. And that's a practice that, are, that you, you guys probably aren't using now, but it used to be really common. And it's really tragic when you get out there and you're seeing 20 or 30 year old ponderosa pine and, or a whole row of them and, they're, and they've got girdling roots because uh, you can, well, if it's, you can cut, it's hard to treat. Usually they pop off before you can have a chance to even try to think about treating it. Um, and then if it comes because of a weed barrier, you know, the weed barrier, uh, have that removed. And I'm sure that you try to talk to uh, landowners when you're putting the weed barrier down to tell them, you know, this is not something that you leave down forever, um, that you should, and, and maybe some folks have a deal where you say, well, you know, it has to come back in five years or whatever the right period of time is, and we'll, we'll help remove that for you. Um, here's uh, uh, issues with cherry and chokeberry. Um, fall webworm, I know you've all seen this. Um, it's kind of a, a common defoliator. And then black knot fungus. Um, and uh, when, it's, uh, when, when it's moisture, those spores will spread. Um, and both of those things, you just have to kind of prune out. If you don't like the fall webworm, and you can prune it out. And I don't know, you can put it in your burn barrel or, or, or turn it into a torch or whatever. Um, or some people just step on it to squish them. Uh, and black knot fungus, you prune and prune and prune, but some trees just get it really bad and some don't. And then we've got um, uh, uh, apple and crab apple. I'm sure you've seen fire blight where it looks like um, just a branch here and there are kind of um, falling down, uh, falling down, curling like a shepherd's crook. This is a bacteria um, and it infects the blossoms and then it kills the branch tips. Is there, oh, you can't see that picture. Um, I'm, I'm sorry about that. So now the Zoom people, the Zoom people can probably see these pictures, but we can. Okay, and then there's black rot cancer. It's a fungus that uh, infects and weakens wounded tissues. So about the only thing you can really do here, uh, the best thing you can do is just prune out what's damaged and then um, clean your pruning tools between cuts so that you're not spreading, the, spreading, the, not spreading the disease. Okay, I said I would talk about diversity. Sustainability, in your windbreaks is a function of biodiversity, okay? Planting a single row windbreak, that's not very sustainable um, because it, that, that all those trees are subject to all of the same stresses, insects and whatever, and they'll pass it along one from the other. Remember those, remember those elm trees and what they swap? Well, not everything swaps their, their own uh, moisture, but you know, some, anything that, that that uh, tree row is going to get, um, it'll share. It'll share its, uh, they'll share its, all the, it's vulnerable, okay? That's what I was trying to get to. So look at uh, age class differences, you know, have some small trees growing up, you know, add, go ahead and add your row, uh, add a row or two or however many rows that are, well, you can afford uh, to your windbreak before, um, before the whole thing needs to be renovated, if you can. Um, add uh, trees, yeah, add lots of different kinds of species. And I'm not sure, oh, that's kind of <laughs> Sorry, oh man. The first few slides I made bigger so you could see, uh, but I didn't do that first. Okay, well anyway, um, what, uh, what pests, okay, Ooh, let's see, I think there's one more thing. Here's how you can help trees. Put the right tree in the right place, okay? Diversify. Lots of different kinds of trees, as many different kinds of trees as you can that are adapted to the soil. Um, 
and plant resistant cultivars. Somebody said something about uh, alder, prairie, hori prairie something alder this morning. Okay, that's a, a nice cultivar that works up here if you can um, get it for windbreaks. Otherwise, alder, alder itself is pretty good. All right. Now, one thing I'd like you to do is if you can scan that little dealy up there, and then you can get the sick tree assistance request form on your smartphone right now. And then when you have a problem with a tree, and if you need to come up closer and, and get it, then when you have, when, when you run across a pest problem, uh, any one of the wonderful pest problems that I've discussed here or something that completely stumps you, get it? Okay, then you can uh, send that right, you can submit your uh, issue uh, right on your own sick tree uh, assistance request form. Okay. And yes, I'm ready to change. Um, you are actually out of time. I'm out of time. Oh my God. All right. Oh, wow. I talked too much. I'm sorry. All right. Um, no time for questions, but I'll be, I'll be around. And uh, when you do find something, it's, re it's pretty easy to use. You take a picture of it, you fill out a form, send that to Pete, and you won't get somebody with a really wordy response like me. He'll tell you what the problem is and, and, then, and, and how to take care of it or not. Get your, um, get your books and there's some other materials up here I'd like you to take with you. Get your uh, smoky things, smoky things. Or... No, no, I don't have access to that one. I was probably looking on 